name is Kurt Flinchfall. Uh, welcome to Lehigh Valley Church. It's great for you guys to be here today. It's great to have you. Uh, open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 7. And uh, we're going to jump in pretty quickly here. Uh, we're going through our sermon series, our new sermon series, uh, as we're looking at the book of Exodus. And specifically, what we're looking at in Exodus is God forming a people after the plagues. That God creates and molds a people from the plagues. That was Zoom. We got some Zoom issues today, so Zoom is looking like up at me, so I apologize if I have any bats in the cave there. Um, uh, hopefully uh, Camille's camera is not that high quality. You're good. That, the Zoom, Camille, you're fine. That was saying that they were recording it. That's why it made noise. Um, everyone in here was like, wait, someone, I heard a voice. God, is that you? Uh, but amen. So we're looking at God creating a people after the plagues. And what we're going to look at today is we're going to go through the plagues themselves. And the rest of this sermon series is looking at how God molds his people into the people that he wants them to be after those plagues. And what we're going to look at today is we go through the plagues. There's a whole mess of lessons you can do in the plagues of Exodus alone, in the plagues and the signs. We could do a different sermon on each individual sign or plague and look at it at a very micro level. And I would encourage each of you, in your own quiet times, in your own walk with God, to do that. To maybe spend time this week, and to spend each day looking at each individual sign. And, and looking at what God is teaching Pharaoh, Egypt, his people, and us. But what I want to do today, instead of looking at it on that micro level, I want to step back and I want to look at it at the larger level. I want to do an overview of the entire series of signs. And what I want to focus on today is I do think there's a specific aspect of the signs and the plagues that most of the time we misread today. That there's something going on in the way that God is dealing with Pharaoh that I think for most of us we kind of miss. And so we're going to have an overview, and we're going to walk through the different plagues. And this is going to be more teaching than I normally do. And we're going to spend a lot of time looking at two Hebrew words that appear multiple times throughout this series. And those two words are hazak and kaved. And I will talk about them a lot. And as we look in this, throughout the story of the plagues and the signs, in English, especially in the NIV, we'll see the phrasing that, the Pharaoh hardened his heart, or God hardened Pharaoh's heart, or Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And there's actually, every time we see that word in this section of Exodus, it's one of two Hebrew words being used. And there is Havak, Hazak and Kaved. And we're going to look at which one's being used in each time. The word Hazak means to strengthen your resolve. It's the idea of you're tired, you're fatigued, and someone gives you the pep talk, right? As Riley talked about last Sunday, as Chris Williver went to make his second attempt up Everest at Tough Mudder, we hazocked him. We all stood at the top and were like, you can do it, get up here, run, we got you, we'll catch you. We strengthened his heart, we strengthened his conviction and his resolve to tackle that obstacle. And that's the word hazak. The other word used is kaved. And it means to stubborn or to harden. And it's the idea of choosing to kind of stubborn yourself and, and grit your face and refuse to believe what's in front of you and just kind of drag your feet in the sand. And, and it, it's kind of almost the way I picture it as like a toddler who like knows they have to go to bed and doesn't want to. And they go, no! And they like stick their feet in the ground as if they can like hold you back from pulling them. That's Kavet. Regardless of the evidence, regardless of the truth in front of me, I'm going to stubborn my heart to the point where I refuse to accept the reality of the situation. And we're going to spend time looking at those two different words and what we can learn about what God is doing to Pharaoh. And, I, and I'll be honest, a whole mess of what we're going to do today, I am taking from uh, Rabbi David Foreman's book, The Exodus You Almost Passed Over. Um, it's an incredible book. There's a whole mess in it. Like, if you've ever wondered, like, why does Moses start the Exodus by saying, let us go in the wilderness for three days? 
when by the end of it he says we're gone forever, he does a great job of answering that and connecting it to Joseph in Egypt. And there's some really powerful stuff. And so if you're, you want a Bible nerd out, if you want a Bible geek out a little bit at some point, pick up Rabbi Foreman's book, uh, The Exodus You Almost Passed Over. But a lot of what we're doing today comes from his work in that book, and, and we're going to do some other things to it at the end too. Amen? So the title of today's lesson is I Saw the Sign. All right? No one sang. There we go. I was like, someone's going to sing it. All right? I saw the sign. It opened up my eyes. I saw the sign. Uh, and with that, we're going to pray as you guys open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 7. <laughs> Heavenly Father, God, I come to you today and I thank you for pop culture and the laughs that we can have at that expense. Um, but God, I do thank you that you are a God that loves us immensely. Father, that you are a God that is not silent, but that you speak through your word and you continue to speak into our lives today. Father, I do thank you that the powerful things you did in the Exodus are still applicable to our lives today as we come back, as we come together as a people in person to be remolded and reshaped into the people you want us to be after witnessing a year and a half of plagues and pandemics and struggles and issues. And God, that we can take the moment today to look at what you're teaching Pharaoh and to place ourselves in his shoes. To be humble enough today to really look at the story through the eyes of what you're doing in our lives today so that we may follow and be the people you want us to be. Father, is there anything that you want me to say that I haven't thought of, put it on my heart. Is there anything I'm about to say you don't want said, remove it from my lips. But Father, help each one of us to hear what you want us to hear so that we may leave here today knowing you greater and more equipped and willing to make you known in every home across the valley and abroad. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I mean, so at this point in, in chapter 7, one of the interesting things is, is a lot of times as we look at the Exodus, it can be really easy to start to think, well, who's the enemy that God is fighting against? You know, as, as we look at it 2,000 years later, as we look at it understanding the end of the story and seeing the Passover and, and the mighty, powerful hand of God that is enacted upon Egypt, it's really easy to feel like, well, God's at war with the Egyptians, and then, and then you look at a verse like this, and it says, Well, when I raise my powerful hand and bring out the Israelites, the Egyptians will know that I am God. Throughout the Exodus, you'll hear God speaking about His desire for not only the Israelites to know who He is, but for the Egyptians to know as well. So it's easy to read that and go, Well, he, surely He must be going to war against Pharaoh. You know, God in human form, as Pharaoh believed he was. The deity that, that ruled with an iron fist, for those of us who watched that midweek a few weeks ago, and, and ruled over the people with a clenched hand and a rod of fear. Surely he's against Pharaoh. But again, as we, as we read Exodus repeatedly, you actually, and what we'll see today, is God is actually trying to win Pharaoh's heart over through the plagues. So you go, well, well who is it that God is at war against? Next Sunday we'll see the verse, but at the end of the Exodus, at the end of the plagues during the Passover in Exodus 14, God says, it is against the gods of Egypt that I will place judgment right now. <clears throat> that was really beautiful about this entire section we're about to read today is God is going to war against the false gods of Egypt. And again, if you were to study each plague individually on its own, you'll actually see that each plague is a direct assault on a false god of Egypt. The plague of the Nile turning to blood is an attack on one of the Egyptian gods who they, taught, they, they believe the Nile is actually his bloodstream and his gift of life to the, the, the Nile River Valley. And so what does God do? He turns it to blood. He goes, how are you going to stand against me now? He challenges the god that is a frog-headed god by having the frogs come out and die all over Egypt. He challenges the, god, the sun god, Amun-Ra, by what? Having darkness fall over the land. That every single plague is a direct assault and challenge to a false god of Egypt. And what you see as we study it out today is as God comes through Moses to his people, he's not just interested in getting the Israelites out of Egypt. If he wanted that, this would be a very short section of the book. If all God cared about was destroying the Egyptians... And getting the Israelites to safety in the promised land, he could have done it all in one plague. He could have just nuked the city. He could have sent the final plague, the Passover, the, the killing of the firstborn, and it would have been over. You wouldn't have had weeks of this battle and weeks of this growth if all he cared about was getting them out. 
Instead, what we see is each plague grows in its precision and its power and its intensity and its consequences is God is trying to show Pharaoh, to show Egypt, and to show his people who he is. That he's trying to teach them that I am not like the gods you worship. You understand power. You understand plagues and famine and, and these warring different gods that battle for power. And Pharaoh himself understands what it means to have power and authority and control. But God shows up and says, I want my people to celebrate with me. That the whole thing that Moses says over and over again is, I want my people to come in the desert for a celebration. I want to have an intimate relationship with them. I hear their cry. I know what's going on. And I want a personal connection to them. That God is challenging the polytheism of Egypt and saying, I am the one true creator God that desires an intimate relationship with my creation. And if at any point, I believe, if any point in this, Pharaoh would have opened his eyes and been willing to accept that, then I think God would have turned all of Egypt into an example of his people. That if any moment Pharaoh had humbled himself and realized truly this God is different, my life and the way I act as leader must change, then I believe a new partnership would be born. And I believe this story would go very differently. And, and that's kind of a bold claim for many of us who grew up believing God was at war with the Egyptians. So let's look. Let's look at these plagues today and really see what God is doing to Pharaoh's heart. The first sign in Exodus chapter 8. I'm sorry, in Exodus chapter 7 verse 10. I accidentally forgot to put that one on there, so I'm going to read this one from here. So Exodus 7, starting in verse 10. It says, So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron threw his staff down in front of Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a snake. Pharaoh then summoned wise men and sorcerers, and the Egyptian musicians also did the same thing by their secret arts. Each one of them threw down his staff, and it became a snake. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Yet Pharaoh's heart became hard, and he would not listen to them, just as the Lord had said. The very first sign, Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, Moses, he says, Pharaoh, God, the God of the Hebrews, Yahweh, has come to me and he wants his people to be set free. He wants to have a relationship with them. He, he wants them to leave. He's seen what you've done to them and he cares. And to show you that, Aaron takes the staff, throws it on the ground, and it becomes a snake. And Pharaoh, living in the land of Egypt, the land of magic and wonder and power, the most powerful nation in the world, Pharaoh himself, believing himself to be a god, and the connection between the gods and the earth, he pulls in a sorcerer and goes, oh, you want to do magic? You're in the big league, son. That may work in minor league ball, but it don't work up here. Watch this. And his sorcerers come in and they do the same thing. And as he sits back and he sees, see, you're just another sorcerer. You don't know who you're up against. You're up against the greatest power. And as he's saying that, what happens? Aaron's staff swallows the other one's whole. To a polytheistic mind, to Pharaoh, who is the lead priest of Egypt, believing that all of existence was in this balance of these warring gods having control. And, and if the Nile god needing to take control to flood the valley and give, uh, give life to the rivers and, and, and the land of Goshen and the land, the, the sun god needing to come across, the, 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 the god of rain needing to come down and send these rains, that these powers were in conflict with each other. And at any moment, one of them may kind of take control, may get an edge and be able to send what he wants and, and there'd be a war for the other one to take control back. And that nature itself was a god that was in conflict with the different gods within it to bring peace to chaos. And so Pharaoh sees these different snakes and says, alright, so your God is just one of the other deities that's in the wrong league. Until he sees that single staff eat the other two. To Pharaoh's mind, to a polytheistic mind, that what that message said was this is not just another God. That the God of the Hebrews has control over the gods of your gods. He's able to consume them fully. 
everyone, to us, we're just like, oh, yo, God's powerful. He ate the other snakes. To them, they're like, whoa, that, that shouldn't be able to happen. That means their God might really be the only true God. And it says Pharaoh's response, as he sees his magicians be able to do the same things, is it says that he strengthens his heart. He hazaks himself. And in the future verses, I'll highlight it each time. That he sees that the magicians can imitate this power, and he strengthens his resolve that this is no more than just another deity for him to interact with. And he strengthens his resolve. God's response in verse 14, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is unyielding. And in this side, God used the word kvet. That from Pharaoh's perspective, he looks at the situation, he sees all my magicians can do the same thing, so therefore we're going to go to war right now with your God. I'm not giving up this power. But from God's perspective, he says, no, 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 what Pharaoh just did is he became stubborn. I put evidence before him that I am different than his gods. And he refused to see it. And so the plagues begin. This war for Pharaoh's perspective goes on. And in the rest of chapter 7, the first plague is God has Moses and Aaron stand over the banks of the Nile, and the entire Nile River turns to blood. So much so that the fish in it begin to die, that they're not able to drink it. And, and, and Pharaoh sees this, and in verse 22 says, But again, the magicians of Egypt used their magic. And they too turned water into blood. So Pharaoh's heart remained hard. He refused to listen to Moses and Aaron just as the Lord had predicted. Pharaoh returned to his palace and put the whole thing out of his mind. Then all the Egyptians dug along the riverbank to find drinking water, for they couldn't drink the water from the Nile. And I love, again right here, as he sees this, as he sees the entire Nile River turn to blood, the very God that supplied them the Nile and their faith and, and their ability to survive and live and have food and fresh water and the fact that they were a famine-proof land being decimated by this God. Pharaoh turns to his musicians and sees that they too can do this magic. And so what does he do? He says, Pharaoh's heart remained hard. The word there is hazak. He strengthens his resolve. Despite the fact that this God clearly can beat the God of the Nile, he's still just another God. I just got to dig in a little bit more in my defenses. So God ups the ante. In chapter 8, verse 15. Or verse 8. Chapter 8, verse 8. God then sends a plague of, of frogs. And the frogs come out of the river as, as the Nile River is blood for a week. All of a sudden, all these thousands upon thousands of frogs come out. And they fill the entire land. So much so that everywhere they go, every time they sit down to lay in their bed, every time they, they walk into their homes, every time they open their ovens, there are frogs everywhere. You can't move in the land of Egypt without stepping on frogs. And again, the God, one of their gods, is the God with a frog head. Like This is a direct challenge to some of their ideology and their thinking. And Pharaoh has enough. Right? The first plague didn't affect him too much. He just wasn't able to take a bath in the Nile, and he had his servants go dig wells for him. It, was, it just disgruntled him for a week. The second plague now affects him. The plagues, the frogs are even in his palace. His house is even beginning to stink. He can't walk without stepping on frogs. And so in verse 8 it says, Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and begged. Remember, this is Pharaoh. This is the most powerful man in the entire ancient world, who is worshipped as a god. And what does he do here? Begs. Plead with the Lord to take the frogs away from me and my people. I will let your people go so they can offer sacrifices to the Lord. You set the time, Moses replied. Tell me when you want me to pray for you, your officials, and your people. Then you and your houses will be rid of the frogs. They will remain only in the Nile. Now imagine this scene. Imagine you are plagued by frogs. They are everywhere in your entire country. You're fed up. You're begging for them to be gone. And Moses says, sure, you, you name the day. You name the time, and I'll do it. What would you say? Now. Right now. Yesterday. Three hours ago. Do it right now. Look at what, Moses, or what Pharaoh says. Do it tomorrow. Pharaoh said, 
All right, Moses replied. It will be as you have said. Then you will know that there is no one like the Lord our God. The frogs will leave you and your houses, your officials, and your people. They will remain only in the Nile River. What's interesting is Pharaoh says, you know what, do it tomorrow. And Moses' response is, okay. And when that happens tomorrow, you will know that God, this God is different. This is not some polytheistic God fighting for control of the elements. This is one singular creator God. What's interesting is all throughout the Exodus, you'll see this pattern that, that Pharaoh is not really concerned about power. Like, he's never blown away by the power of God. He's never amazed at, like, well, how powerful is it? Because Pharaoh understands power. In a polytheistic Egyptian worldview, the gods were incredibly powerful. They could demolish you if they wanted to. But what doesn't exist in a polytheistic worldview is precision. Because the gods are in conflict with each other. There's tension. And so in a polytheistic worldview, maybe the, maybe the god who, of the Hebrews happened to get an advantage on the god of the frogs. Maybe just today he, he tricked him. He locked him in a closet. I don't know. But he might have just gotten the upper hand today. But if you can make him disappear tomorrow, then clearly this God is precise. This God is not operating in some polytheistic tension. He really has a different level of control. And Moses catches that and he says, great idea, Pharaoh, because what will happen if I do that? You'll know he's different. Again, this whole time, God is trying to show Pharaoh, you are not God. I am. You are not in control. I am. So here's your chance to follow me. You were ignorant before, but I'm giving you a chance. I'm going to give you a chance to do this right. So unfortunately, what happens? Moses and Aaron left Pharaoh's palace, and Moses cried out to the Lord about the frogs he'd inflicted on Pharaoh. And the Lord did just what Moses had predicted. The frogs and the houses, the courtyards and the fields all died. The Egyptians piled them into great heaps and a terrible stench filled the land. But when Pharaoh saw that relief had come, he became stubborn. What word do you think is there? Kaved. He stubborns his heart. He refuses to believe this God is different. This God, he sees the evidence that, whoa, this God's got some precision this God really may be different. I may really be wrong and just be a man. And yet, as soon as there's relief, what's he do? He stubborns his heart. He refuses to accept the evidence before him. He refused to listen to Moses and Aaron, just as the Lord predicted. So he goes on. And then they attack the God of the earth. And they have Moses and Aaron put dirt and hit the ground. And, and these form of gnats begin. And these gnats kind of spread all throughout the land. And there's some type of biting gnat, because you can tell they're very uncomfortable when you read it. The people are in pain. So again, it says, So the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, raise your staff and strike the ground. The dust will turn into swarms of gnats throughout the land of Egypt. So Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded them. When Aaron raised his hand and struck the ground with the staff, gnats infested the entire land, covering the Egyptians and their animals all the dust in the land of Egypt turned to gnats. Pharaoh's magicians tried to do the same thing with their secret arts, but this time they failed. And the gnats covered everyone, people and animals alike. This is the finger of God, the magicians exclaimed to Pharaoh. But Pharaoh's heart remained hard. He wouldn't listen to them just as the Lord predicted. What's interesting about this time is these gnats appear... And Pharaoh turns to his magicians and he goes, do the same thing. Show me. Show me that this is just a battle of wills. That this is just some type of other deity that i got to fight for as the god of Egypt. And his magicians turn back and they're like, yeah, we can't do this. But it's interesting because when they say this is the finger of God, what they're actually saying to him, the word they use is Elohim. We can get into that later. But what they're saying here is don't worry. We can't do this, but this is just the act of a god. Like, and what they're actually saying to Pharaoh here is, we were wrong, this God's a lot more powerful than we thought, so we're going to have to up the ante. They're saying this isn't just simple magic. We're not on equal playing field, Moses. He's actually, this God is fighting you. But they strengthen the resolve that what? You just got to go harder. 
The enemy is more entrenched than you think. Fight harder. And so what does Pharaoh do? His heart remained hard. The word there is hazak. He strengthens his love. Okay, we're against a more powerful being than I thought. He doesn't know who he's messing with. Let's keep going. So in verse 20, Then the Lord said to Moses, Get up early in the morning and stand in Pharaoh's way as he goes down to the river. I love the audacity there. Like, oh, he's not listening. Just go stand in his way tomorrow. Like, I feel like Pharaoh's coming out of his house. He sees Moses and he's like, oh, come on. Like, I can't even get a break from this guy. Say to him, this is what the Lord says. Let my people go so they can worship me. If you refuse, then I will send swarms of flies on you, your officials, your people, and all the houses. The Egyptian homes will be filled with flies, and the ground will be covered with them. But this time, I will spare the region of Goshen, where my people live. No flies will be found there. Then you will know that I am the Lord, and that I am present even in the heart of your land. I will make a clear distinction between my people and your people. This miraculous sign will happen tomorrow. And the Lord did just as he said. A thick swarm of flies filled Pharaoh's palace and the houses of his officials. The whole land of Egypt was thrown into chaos by the flies. Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, All right, go ahead and offer your sacrifice to your God, he said, but do it here in this land. But Moses replied, That wouldn't be right. The Egyptians detest the sacrifices that we offer to the Lord our God. Look, if we offer our sacrifices here where the Egyptians can see us, they will stone us. We must take a three-day trip into the wilderness to offer sacrifice to the Lord our God, just as he commanded this. All right, go ahead, Pharaoh replied. I will let you go into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord your God. But don't go too far away. Now hurry and pray for me. Moses answered, As soon as I leave you, I will pray to the Lord, and tomorrow the swarms of flies will disappear from you and your officials and all your people. But I am warning you, Pharaoh, don't lie to us again and refuse to let the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. So Moses left Pharaoh's palace and pleaded with the Lord to remove all the flies. Oh, that part should have been. And the Lord did as Moses asked and caused the swarms of flies to disappear from Pharaoh, his officials, and his people. Not a single fly remained, but Pharaoh again became stubborn and refused to let the people go. Again, this, this story of precision. Now God steps up the game. He goes, okay, you're, you're still not listening. Flies are coming next. But I'm going to stop them from coming to the land of Goshen. Not only do I have control over the days, not only can I have precision over when these things happen and what time they happen, but I have precision about where they happen. I'll let them happen in the Egyptian part of Egypt, not the Israelite part. And again, what happens... It's interesting here, at the very end, it says, but Pharaoh again became stubborn. Again, which word do you think that is? Kvet. That he sees, whoa, this God can not only control the days, he can even control where in the land this happens. And he stubborns his heart. He refuses to give up the power and the belief that he is God. Moving on. After that, we get even more precision. It says, go back to Pharaoh, the Lord commanded Moses. Tell him, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says. Let my people go so they can worship me. If you continue to hold them and refuse to let them go, the hand of the Lord will strike all your livestock. Your horses, donkeys, camels, cattle, sheep, and goats with a deadly plague. But the Lord will again make a distinction between the livestock of the Israelites and that of the Egyptians. Not a single one of Israel's animals will die. The Lord has already set the time for the plague to begin. He has declared that He will strike the land tomorrow. And the Lord did just as He said. The next morning all the livestock of the Egyptians died, but the Israelites didn't lose a single animal. Pharaoh sent his officials to investigate, and they discovered that the Israelites had not lost a single animal. But even so, Pharaoh's heart remained stubborn, and he still refused to let the people go. God goes, okay, you're still not getting it? I'm going to go one step further. Not only do I have the precision to control the days, 
Not only do I have the decision to control the where, but I can control it on a micro level. I'm going to single out which cattle. I'm going to not allow a single animal of the Israelites to die. And again, if you think I'm kind of losing my mind and I've been reading too many commentaries, look at Pharaoh's response. If I came to you and said, I'm going to wipe out every single cattle you own, or better yet, if I said, I'm going to have a bank crisis, crash. This, this is our modern day of understanding the cattle. If I said, we're going to have a bank crisis, you're going to lose every penny you've ever made, but not a single member of the LVC is going to lose a dollar. Yeah. You, what you would care about is you would go check your bank account, right? You'd be like, did I really lose everything? And you'd be like, where did it go? And that's all you would care about. And yet, what is Pharaoh concerned with? Go check their accounts. Does he really have the ability to control down to which cattle? Even if they're possibly what? In the same grazing area. And again, seeing this mounting evidence of who God is. Pharaoh's faced with the decision to submit and be humble and actually follow God. Or stubborn his heart and continue to try to live the lie that he is in control. So again, God ups the ante. He has boils begin to form. Verse 8, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take handfuls of soot from a brick kiln and have Moses toss it in the air while Pharaoh watches. The ashes will spread like fine dust over the whole land of Egypt, causing festering boils to break out on people and animals throughout the land. So they took soot from a brick kiln and went and stood before Pharaoh. As Pharaoh watched, Moses threw the soot into the air and boils broke out on the people and animals alike. Even the magicians were unable to stand before Moses because the boils had broken out on them and all the Egyptians. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. And just as the Lord had predicted to Moses, Pharaoh refused to listen. This is the first time in the entire story of Exodus that God steps in to intervene with Moses. A lot of times we look at this and we tend to read the entire story of the plagues as God just hardens Pharaoh's heart and, and kind of uses Pharaoh as like an unwilling punching bag to show his power, right? And that's not the image we've seen at all. Up until this moment, the person choosing how he responds is who? Pharaoh. And these boils break out and they're so bad that even the magicians, like, they're taken out of the equation. Like, this whole time, they're in Pharaoh's ear. They're probably trying to help him explain reasons why what Moses is saying can't really be true. Right? Like, you know you're really God. Like, we know you're really in control. Like, and I'm sure they're finding all these little theological loopholes to try to find ways for what Moses is saying to not be true. And so God takes them out of the equation. They're not even there. They can't stand. They're doubled over. They're in pain. And it says that the Lord then steps in and what? hardens Pharaoh's heart. The Hebrew word here is hazak. Actually, what God does is He strengthens, He encourages Pharaoh to not quit. What this is saying is God saw Pharaoh ready to give up out of pure frustration. Pharaoh's in pain and his trusted allies can't help him. So what's he about to do? Throw his hands up in the air and be like, I give up. Just get out of here. You people are not worth this. And he's about to give up without actually gaining a conviction about who God is. He's about to give up because of lack of will rather than a decision of faith. A decision of whether or not he will submit to God. And so what does God do? Encourages him. Again, that word, hazak, means he strengthened his resolve. He uplifted his willingness to keep fighting. Why? Because God doesn't just want you to quit. God wants you to make a decision. So it goes on after the boils. Coming into the last two here. And this is different. What's interesting about this one is even Moses' response to Pharaoh makes us a different type of plague. Chapter 9, verse 13, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Get up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh. Tell him, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says. Let my people go so they can worship me. If you don't, I will send more plagues on you and your officials and your people. Then you will know that there is no one like me in all the earth. By now, 
I could have lifted my hand and struck you and your people with a plague to wipe you off the face of the earth. I told you, he could have just went nuclear from the beginning. Or he's like, listen, Pharaoh, like by now I could have just wiped you all out. But I'm trying to teach you something. I'm trying to show you who I really am and the reality of who's really in control. But I've spared you for a purpose. Why? And what I said earlier, God wants to teach Pharaoh. Why has he spared him? To show you, Pharaoh, my power. And to spread my fame throughout the earth. He says, up until now I've spared you because I'm trying to show you, Pharaoh, who I am. I want to give you, even you, the one who claims to be God, the one who controls other people's destinies, the one who refuses to listen to anyone else, the one who hurts people, even you get a chance to know me. But you still lord it over my people and refuse to let them go. You're still stubborn. You're still choosing, Pharaoh, to not admit that I'm lord. You're still choosing to be lord of Egypt. And you're hurting people with that. So tomorrow, at this time, I will send a hailstorm, more devastating than any in all the history of Egypt. Quick, order your livestock and servants to come in from the fields to find shelter. Is that a good military strategy? All right, so tomorrow we're going to bomb you. At 12, get everything out from the open. Like, this is not... A God that's trying to destroy, he's saying, I'm going to do one last thing to show you. And, and the word used for hail is actually the idea, and, and we'll see it a little bit later, but the specific word for hail, what it says is that it was, it was raining fiery ice balls. So from a polytheistic mind, think about that for a minute. Fire and ice, do they ever work together? No! Those two gods are mortal enemies. It's like the Dallas Cowboys and the Philadelphia Eagles. Like They're never going to work together. Like they are mortal enemies. Like I will root for the Eagles and whoever Dallas is playing each week. Fire and ice gods do not mix. And he says, I'm going to prove to you that I am the only one. I'm going to prove to you that I am the creator. Fire and ice are coming for you. They're going to wipe you out. So get everyone into cover. Some of Pharaoh's officials were afraid because of what the Lord had said. They quickly brought their servants and livestock in from the fields. But those who paid no attention to the word of the Lord left theirs out in the open. Then the Lord said to Moses, Lift your hand towards the sky so hail may fall on the people, the livestock and all the plants throughout the land of Egypt. So Moses lifted his staff toward the sky, and the Lord sent thunder and hail and lightning flash toward the earth. The Lord sent a tremendous hailstorm against all the land of Egypt. Never in all the history of Egypt had there been a storm like that with such devastating hail and continuous lightning. It left all of Egypt in ruins. The hail struck down everything in the open field. People, animals, and plants alike, even the trees were destroyed. The only place without hail was the region of Goshen, where the people of Israel lived. Then Pharaoh quickly summoned Moses and Aaron and said, This time I have what? Sin. Pharaoh recognizes there's actually a morality going on here. For the first time, rather than just begging for money, he goes, okay, I've sinned. He confessed, the Lord is righteous and my people and I are what? Wrong. This is the breaking point. He sees, okay, we've been wrong. I, I have sinned. I, I've stood against God. I've led people astray. I am not God on earth. I am not the connection between heaven and earth. I am not in control. And man, have I hurt people. Man, have I done this wrong. And the implications of that for Pharaoh are immense. Like, think about what Pharaoh had to lose if he would humble himself and admit that God was right. He lost all of his power. He lost all of his slaves. He lost people worshipping him. Not figuratively, like literally. That's really hard to let go of. When you're used to being God, when you're used to being Lord and in control, it's really hard to let go of that. It says, please beg the Lord to end this terrifying thunder and hail. We've had enough. I will let you go. You don't need to stay any longer. All right, Moses replied. As soon as I leave the city, I will lift my hands and pray to the Lord. Then the thunder and hail will stop and you will know that the earth belongs to the Lord. 
And I love Moses here. But I know that you and your officials still don't fear God. And all the flax and barley were ruined by the hail because the barley had formed heads and the flax was budding, but the wheat and the emmer wheat were spared because they had not yet sprouted from the ground. So Moses left Pharaoh's court and went out of the city. When he lifted his hands to the Lord, the thunder and hail stopped and the downpour ceased. But when Pharaoh saw that the rain, hail, and thunder had stopped, he and his officials sinned again, and Pharaoh again became stubborn. Because his heart was hard, Pharaoh refused to let the people leave, just as the Lord had predicted. Pharaoh finally comes to this place where the evidence is overwhelming. And he realizes, I have sinned, I am wrong. I need to change. There is a God and I am not Him. Is the realization Pharaoh comes to. And so he begs for mercy. He begs for it to change. And as soon as he gets relief, what happens? He looks at all that he would give up and goes, yeah, I'm not letting go of that. And he stubborns his heart. He says, I refuse to believe the truth that is set before me. I refuse to believe the evidence that I have seen. I'm not letting go of my throne. I'm not letting go of being Lord. And this is the moment it changes. This is the moment where God goes, okay, now I'm going to teach the Israelites how much I can protect them. And if you were to keep studying the rest of the plagues, you will see that God now gets involved. And it says that God is going to keep allowing Pharaoh's heart to be more stubborn. And I think sometimes we read that and we think God steps in with this like spiritual power and, and kind of makes Pharaoh's heart against his free will. I, that's actually not what I see. And I'd encourage you to go read it. Because what happens next is, is Pharaoh kind of changes his mind. And then he, let, he kicks him out. Like, they say locusts are going to come. Like, oh, like the hail destroyed everything except the plants that hadn't budded yet. Like, you know, the plants that are now starting to bud a week later. The locusts are going to eat them all. And Pharaoh gets angry. He goes, get him out of here. I don't want to see your face again. Right? And, and I love the... Um, what ends up happening is, as they leave, as Moses and Aaron leave, they don't give him a second chance to change his mind. They say the plague and they walk out. And Pharaoh's servants chase them down and convince them to come back. What we end up seeing... I summarized all that. There we go. So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh, chapter 10, verse 8. All right, he told them, go and worship the Lord your God. But who exactly will be going with you? Right, what's, what's Pharaoh doing here? He's giving up, but he's trying to save a little bit of face. Right? Honestly, what he's doing is he's just looking for a compromise. Like If Moses had just responded with like, well, we could leave a couple cattle. I think Pharaoh would be like, okay, cool, we got a deal. Right? But the problem is Pharaoh is still trying to say, well, I'm God, I let them go. And, and God goes, no, 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 that's, that's not how this is going to go. I need to show my people who I really am. If you're not going to listen, they're going to know my protection. And so what happened? Moses responds with the dumbest political move in history. All he has to do is say, I'll leave some cattle. How about we give you a chicken or two? And he gets out, right? A great deal. What's Moses say? We will all go. Young and old, sons and daughters, our flocks and herds. He's like, ain't a single person. that He eggs them on. And what happens? Pharaoh's pride flares up. He's like, well, then you're all going to die. And again, we see this moment where because he will not humble himself, God then has to take care of him. And why is this important? 2 Timothy chapter 4. You can turn your Bibles over there. You can read it on screen in a second. Actually, can you just click 2 Timothy chapter 4 for me? Thank you. 2 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to close out in this verse. Testament, this is Paul speaking to Timothy. As a young Christian, he says, I solemnly urge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead when he comes to set up his kingdom, preach the word. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching, they will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. 
they will reject the truth and chase after myths. Why is it so important to realize that God is using each of these escalating troubles to teach Pharaoh a lesson? Because each one of us is Pharaoh in our own lives. What is Pharaoh? Pharaoh is Lord of Egypt. He is the controller. He's in charge. And we live lives where we are the Lord of our lives. We do what we want, how we want, when we want. We justify the choices we make. We decide, we decide what's right and what's wrong. And sometimes it doesn't even matter based on the day, right? We've all been guilty of like, that is so wrong. I can't believe someone would do that to me. And then you go do the same thing to someone else. You're like, but it's different when I do it. I'm justified, right? We, we become Lord of our own lives. Gets our attention through these situations and these challenges and life situations. And he shows us these signs. Because I'm trying to teach you that, guess what? You're not Lord. What was he trying to teach Pharaoh? There is a God, and you're not him. What's the same message God tries to teach us? There is a God, and you're not him or her. He says, I am Lord. And no matter what you've done, no matter how bad you've hurt people, And you being Lord of your life, you choosing to control your life, it hurts people and it hurts yourself and it causes chaos and it causes a mess in the world. Everything we talked about the last couple weeks. He says, and I'm giving you a chance to change. And so what does God do? He sends plagues. He sends earthquakes. He sends upheavals. He shakes the foundation of our lives in gradually louder and louder ways until we finally see who He is. And then we're faced with a decision. God will not allow us to just throw our hands up and quit. I'll tell you right now, the reason God gets in to strengthen Pharaoh's resolve is the same reason that if you go, this is crazy, I'm never following Jesus, and you walk out of here, you're still going to run into disciples who share their faith with you. You're still going to get God shaking you. You're still going to have someone reach out to you. I, I had a friend of mine, we studied the Bible with him. He got to the point of repentance and baptism, and, and he was like, you know what, this is crazy. I don't believe this. You're trying to tell me I'm not right with God because I, I'm not fully in. Forget it, man. He gets all angry. He like walks all the way home through the hood of Philly. Like Just doesn't even realize he didn't even take septic. He just got angry and walked like eight miles through the hood. Gets back to temple and he said for the next six months, every time he'd be at a party, he'd be getting drunk and like two or three beers in, he'd be like taking a sip and in the back of his head, a voice would be like, this is fun, but you know you're going to hell, dog. And he'd be like, ah! shut up, like, drink more. And then finally he called me. He's like, all right, I can't quit. Like God's going to chase me down. I got to make a decision. Let's look at this again. God's not going to let you just throw your hands up and quit. He's going to keep shaking the foundation until you see enough that you can make a decision. And at that moment, you have to decide. Is Jesus Lord? And am I going to change my life and live that way? Or am I going to refuse to believe the truth and live out a lie? And that's the choice between every one of us. Will you kvet yourself? Will you stubborn your heart and say, regardless of what the Bible says, I refuse to believe it. And if that's the boat you choose, then you get the second three, the final three plagues. And God says, okay, I'm going to make an example. You're the anti-story now. I'm going to show the people that are willing to listen what really happens. Each of us have a choice. Whether we live as if Jesus is Lord or we are Lord. And as we leave here today, the choice before each one of us is which choice will you make? Who will sit on the throne of your life? To God be the glory. We're going to have one final song before we close.